Hello and good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for joining this online policy dialogue. Uh, today, we are going to be taking stock of the EU's efforts against disinformation over the last few years. Um, and we'll also be looking towards the future and uh, seeing what current challenges still remain and what the next steps are likely to be. There are a couple of reasons why this is a good time for such a discussion. Um, the immediate occasion is that the European Court of Auditors earlier this month published its audit on the EU's efforts against disinformation, uh, with particular regard to the action plan against disinformation that was announced jointly by the European Commission and the External Action Service in December 2018. We'll hear about the audit and its recommendations uh, today from the responsible member of the court, Mr. Tomei, in a moment. Um, but I will take its title as an indication first. It's tackled but not tamed. And I think that already hints that the challenge of disinformation is still some distance from being overcome entirely. Uh, but the publication of the audit is just one of the recent developments in this field. Uh, in the last four years since the uh, disinformation action plan was announced, quite a lot has changed. After all, four years is a long time in tech. It's a long time in politics. Over that period, there's been changing geopolitical circumstances. There's been a global pandemic, of course, which has been accompanied by a huge amount of conflicting information. And the EU's response has also been developing. Uh, there have been multiple new initiatives, the most notable of which are perhaps the measures against disinformation, uh, which are contained in the European Democracy Action Plan and the Digital Services Act. So discuss, to discuss these in more detail, I'm delighted uh, to introduce European Commission Vice President of Values and Transparency, Vera Jourova, uh, who will be our keynote speaker today. Um, following her speech, there should be time for one or two uh, brief questions from the audience before she will have to leave us. Um, and we will then turn to our panel to hear more about the audit and a few reactions. So if you have very brief questions for the Vice President, please put them in the chat and I will come to them if there's time. I stress, please do be brief. And further questions I will keep for the panel. Vice Presidents, um, about one year ago, you were kind enough to speak at the EPC uh, about the EU's efforts against disinformation during the COVID pandemic. I'd like to invite you to take the floor again today and tell us what has changed since that time and to reflect on the experience of the 2018 action plan and what the next steps for the EU are likely to be. Vice President, please, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, uh, I am here after one year and I hope I can tell you some new things, <laughs> something what happened in the meantime, because I think I have something to say because we have been very active in uh, our plan to, to, how did you say, to tackle but not to tame. <laughs> because taming might mean that we will overshoot. Uh, we are good in regulation, regulating things in the EU, but uh, when it comes to uh, technologies, uh, digital area, <clears throat> we first of all see that this is the space for, for a public debate. Uh, this is the space where we have to protect the freedom of speech. And this is also the space where we have to look at the risks and dangerous developments and to address them in a, in a targeted way. So this is what we tried to do. <clears throat> and I think also COVID-19 showed that uh, we are under uh, uh, bigger pressure, uh, health, economic pressure, but also democracy is under stress test. And the combination of COVID crisis and already the dangerous uh, developments before COVID uh, uh, created uh, quite uneasy to drink cocktail, uh, which uh, we do not want to, to, to drink in Europe. So that's why we, we want to address the risks uh, also to, to democracy. Uh, where I see uh, democracy is, is under, under threat, and I have a lot of evidence, is that the trust towards democratic institutions, be it governments, parliaments, or also the media, or even scientists is in decline. And uh, we all are aware that trust is a lifeblood of democracy. Without trust, it is very difficult, if not impossible, to build a consensus, a tolerance, and have common goals as democratic societies. This is why Europe wants to fight back. 
and support different elements needed for democratic revival. For the first time, the EU has adopted a comprehensive European democracy action plan. Uh, it was in December last year. The plan looks at all the aspects of democracy and draws a path of actions on many fronts. The aim is to empower the citizens and voters to protect electoral processes, to support media and also fight against disinformation. For us, the key goal is uh, to have in Europe the citizens, not only the voters, but the citizens who can make autonomous choices, who have their fate in their hands, who are not manipulated, who are not brainwashed. And uh, I don't speak only about the period before and around elections. I think that we have to uh, minimize the, the effect of, of disinformation and manipulation, which uh, is abusing also the digital technologies, which have a tendency to uh, make a, an easy to manipulate crowd instead of individual citizens who have their own autonomous will. This is what we try to stop this, this, uh, this tendency, uh, which uh, the technologies are, are, are helping to drive. Uh, I will focus on the last element, which I mentioned in relation to ADAPT, to a European Democracy Action Plan, uh, and it's the disinformation, because this is. This is not a new phenomenon. This is what is new is the intensity of amplification. Uh, the fact that this information flies quicker and sells better. And the fact that the digital space is such a, a fertile ground for dissemination of disinformation, which is not illegal content, but which is harmful content. Uh, and so we have to uh, uh, be careful in introducing uh, some, some regulation because as I said before, our family silver in Europe, uh, but also in, in the whole democratic world is the freedom of expression. So, so we are extremely, extremely careful here. Uh, we uh, already adopted uh, the first uh, strategy against disinformation in 2018. Then we came as the code of practice against disinformation, which uh, we are now upgrading because we clearly see some, some downsides, some, some short, shortcomings in the, in the current code. Speaking about code, of course, it's not a legally binding legislation. It's a voluntary commitment of the platforms and advertisers to actively do something against the, the spread of disinformation. I mentioned before the COVID time, well, extraordinary crisis uh, requires also extraordinary measures. So for, for COVID time, we uh, agreed on special set of actions against this information, which uh, has the potential to do harm to health and lives of people. And, and in that period of COVID, uh, time which is a, a, a gift from heaven for disinformers. Yeah? Uh, we, uh, we agreed on the arrangement that the platforms will uh, provide priority space uh, for the authorized information, reliable information from the health authorities and the disinformation will be put aside or even removed in case it's proven to be, to be really dangerous to health of people. But that's extraordinary measure. We cannot continue like that. We do not want anyone to be the authoritative uh, arbiter. I would even want to say dictator of the truth because this is what it is about. Nobody should dictate what the truth is but we have to be more resilient against the disinformation. We have to uh, differentiate between facts and opinions, which is also the logic of our code of practice. We want the facts to be uh, checked, uh, fact checked. We want the platforms to <coughs> hire the fact checkers. We want them to label the disinformation, which is delivering false facts. 
verifiably and uh, false, false facts. And uh, we want them not to touch the opinions so that the freedom of speech is, is guaranteed. Also, we want to empower the people because uh, I think that uh, it cannot be just a top-down approach because this, so sorry, I will use the, the words which might be misinterpreted, but this cleaning service, <laughs> I believe should be outsourced. It cannot be Facebook doing that. It cannot be some ministry of truth doing that. No, it has to be the matter of the whole society to contribute to the cleaning, to bringing the facts to light and to bringing the arguments. That's why in our upgraded code of practice, which should start working uh, after the new year, we want uh, the citizens uh, to send uh, notifications of uh, discover disinformation uh, and to ask for fact checking and to be informed back what happened with the notification. So there should be some very vivid interaction uh, uh, between the, those who are uh, managing the platforms, who are providing the space, who are monetizing the disinformation also. Uh, so we want this, this interaction between those uh, entities and the citizens and the fact checkers and professional journalists. And on, on the latter two, we want them to be paid. It cannot be done, this cleaning service cannot be done for free yeah, because the business model is absolutely unfavorable for the professional journalists and for those who work with the facts. I am not keeping with my papers, yes? So stop me when it's <laughs> high time. <laughs> Because whenever I got I get passionate, I, I, I forget to read the papers. Um, also, what we want by this upgraded code of practice is to bring more pragmatism to the fight against disinformation. We simply do not want the money to feed the disinformers. That's why we will invite more signatories from the uh, side of uh, advertisers to join the code and to make an agreement that their client's money should not be connected with the systems where there is an intense appearance of disinformation. Uh, we want to cut the disinformers of the money. I once said that we want to starve them out. Yes, this is what we want to do. We have to be pragmatic. This whole of society approach I spoke about, uh, inviting people, the, the, the citizens, inviting the, the journalists. This is part of the network we have created and we want to upgrade also because we have now the network of the commission, the external action service, where we are monitoring uh, in a large scale, the foreign influence, we are working with Joseph Borrell on some sanctions uh, against those who are permanently attacking the, the European space with the well-targeted disinformation, uh, with the aim to, to uh, destroy our societies and our, the, the trust I spoke about before. So, so we are working on that front. So that's the commission that the external service and at the member state level, we are creating the network of uh, state bodies, mainly from the ministers of interior, of home affairs, but also with the ministries of defense when it comes to foreign, foreign attacks, because we cannot help it. Disinformation has been, or information has have been weaponized. Yeah, so we need to work also with the, with the ministers of defense. There is the line to NATO. And also in some member states, there, is a, there are units dealing with the issue of disinformation uh, at the ministries of foreign affairs. Why I am mentioning all those involved, this is value in itself. And this has to be developed further because uh, every time I ask whether we are not ridiculous that we are not enough, giving enough money for the, in the European budget for the fight against disinformation, uh, compared with what Russia is investing into 
well-targeted propaganda, which is influencing European space and and uh, to toxicizing, is it the right word? <laughs> uh, the 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 atmosphere in Europe. Well, this is not about the money. This is this is about the collective energy we will do uh, to, to, to tackle with this problem. Uh, the legislation here cannot help. And I, I am a true believer that if we start to legislate on this, disinformation, removals, uh, assessing the truth, it's exactly that good intention which leads to hell. Yeah? This will be the start of censorship. Here, my instinct of somebody who lived in, in a heavily censored society in, in communist Czechoslovakia is shouting, <laughs> we, but this must not happen. Uh, that's why we were so careful and we didn't cover the issue of disinformation by the Digital Services Act, which we adopted in December and which is covering the issue of illegal content. There, we have to be very strict. What's illegal offline has to be also considered uh, and, and dealt with uh, uh, as, the, as illegal online. Here I speak about uh, hate speech. Uh, I warn the platforms already now under the code of, of, of uh, conduct against hate speech, I want them to work in all European languages. And the decisions of the courts, which have been de deciding on what is illegal hate speech. It cannot be just some offensive, offensive content. It has to be hate speech as it is defined in the criminal law. So such hate speech has to be removed. Then child pornography, then terrorism and extremism. In Digital Services Act, you see a very strong push from us Towards the platforms and the and the and internet actors to remove illegal content and to be transparent uh, on how the algorithms work, in, in short. But we have not covered two things: the disinformation for the for the reasons I described, and political advertising. Yeah, because here we need to be stricter. We cannot see the business method to sell the normal products to consumers. We cannot see this method to be used to sell the political parties and politicians and political visions to citizens. Here we will be stricter and we are preparing the legislation. It's a complex thing. We just had a meeting uh, on that with, with my team and I still have a headache. <laughs> we, I am now recovering with you because <laughs> this is a complex issue and we, we want to enable political advertising online, of course, but it has to have stricter rules than for the normal commercial uh, kind of activities. Um, I think I will stop here. There is a lot of happening. Uh, uh, we, as when I said, ju just two last comments. When I said we are creating the network, here I have to mention the European Digital Media Observatory, which uh, is uh, something, in my view, very useful. The observatory has started in op its operation in June 2020, so the work is in progress. And now, uh, EDMO, this observatory, has already established a working infrastructure where fact checkers and researchers can collaborate once it becomes fully operational. And moreover, a completely independent advisory board has been appointed to make sure the observatory is effective and non-biased. Uh, and also the national hubs that would complement the work of observatory on European level with a national perspective on local instances of disinformation have been selected recently and will be operative in the next few weeks. This is partly financed from European budget and partly by private sources. Last comment, uh, when introducing rules for digital world, we do not have anyone to copy or follow. In Europe, we are the first ones. And I think we are well placed. 
because uh, in Europe, I, I believe we have healthy instincts on the risks which we see in digital sphere. We are not so blind uh, as the Americans because there it has been driven by big money and big push from, from big industry and also the laissez fair approach of Americans also on data protection or pr protection of privacy. We have seen this is there. And we are also well placed in, in Europe to come with human centered legislation or rules, uh, which China cannot do. There, the technologies are being deployed for surveillance state functioning. Yeah? So I think in Europe, we have health instinct, we can go forward. Uh, and we are inviting others to join. And you know that there is a vivid debate in G7. There will be, I'm sure, debates also in, in G20, but uh, I do not want to predict anything on that front. But especially with the United States and the United Kingdom, we have a very open space now for, for incredibly fruitful synergy and cooperation on, on uh, bringing to life very meaningful rules because we have to face the fact that we are not solving European issues only. These are global issues. And uh, if we do not minimize the risks stemming from digital revolution, it will be endangering, they will be endangering democracy through that attack on trust in the whole democratic world. That's why also we have to hurry up. And with the Americans, I am really happy now we try to we start to try to, to draw a new chapter. Uh, I had a good debate with the Commerce Secretary uh, Gina Raimondo. Uh, colleagues are working now on setting up the techno technology and uh, trade council, uh, which is an initiative uh, of, of uh, President Biden and, and his his offer for cooperation. So we can we can develop something something uh, good together and I'm, I'm really looking forward to this trans especially transatlantic but also trans uh, la Manche, uh, cooperation thank you very much <clears throat> thank you very much vice president um i think many of the issues you've raised are things that we will touch upon in the rest of the session with the panel particularly regarding the code of practice which is mentioned in the audit and transatlantic um cooperation and uh, one other point which I want to briefly come back to if I have 30 seconds for a, a question to round off um, is regarding um, the role of the various different institutions um, within the EU. So for example you mentioned uh, the distinction between um, illegal content and uh, content that's not illegal but is still harmful. The other big distinction I can see to make between disinformation is that which comes from outside, from external sources, such whether it be Russia or China or um, other actors, versus that which is homegrown, so to speak, disinformation that uh, has an internal dimension to it, where perhaps some of the freedom of expression issues that you mentioned become more, uh, more of an issue. Oh. Um, so the, this is a, a question from Emmanuel Helenakis. Um, who is asking about the, the line between fighting disinformation and carrying out communication campaigns on the part of the EU institutions. Um, that can be a little bit blurred sometimes and it can potentially lead to overlap between uh, various commission DGs and the European External Action Service, which we will hear from later. So as a, a quick question to round things off, within the EU, who should be responsible for what uh, and what role can the EU institutions play in tackling the internal dimension of disinformation? Uh -huh. <clears throat> yeah, indeed, uh, very good question. Uh, I, I was uh, explaining how proud I am of all that network, <laughs> which is very wide now, but important thing is that uh, everybody does what he or she, uh, as for the institutions, uh, are, are authorized to do. So for external line, uh, this is obviously Joseph Borrell in the Commission and the External Action Service, uh, which has the Istratcom team, which is focusing on, on uh, monitoring the disinformation from Russia. There are experts who understand and know very well the language and they, they can 
uh, uh, read through the rows, not only the the, the main uh, the main uh, uh, the, uh, statements, but also what's beyond that. Uh, we are very advanced in the uh, ability of analyzing uh, the differentiation of the of the subjects, because before COVID, it was very highly differentiated as for what will work where. So. Uh, you can imagine in East European countries, the after communism sentiment uh, could work. Uh, in 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 the Netherlands, there was a massive campaign after the uh, when when the investigation on on MH17 uh, flight uh, started. Uh, so it it was uh, it, in the past differentiated. Now it's more homo homogeneous when it comes to COVID and anti vaccination. So this is for external action service, foreign affairs, and uh, and uh, defense ministry ministries. This is the job for them, because when it comes to Russia uh, and partly China, uh, it, it's also becoming the issue. Uh, there is the security aspect in it. Yeah. So so uh, for, rightly so, NATO and the ministries of defense are, are dealing with that. We have created a, uh, the so-called rapid alert system, which has been triggered when there is an extremely dangerous uh, kind of disinformation, which can really solve uh, some, some uh, uh, movements in the society, some, some alarming news, uh, which will create panic and so on. Uh, so uh, that's, that's the external line. Internal line, yes, indeed. Unfortunately, we have a lot of our producers. Many of them are on one line or are the proxies of the external uh, forces. Uh, but uh, here it is the matter of, of mine and of uh, the ministries of home affairs, mainly at the member state level. And here we are, uh, the, the system I described is covering both external and internal, internal production. But there was something about communication campaigns. I, I have to add one thing, the lesson from COVID. The more we tried to stop the flood of disinformation, which came with COVID and with vaccination, the more I realized that the space which we will leave are free will be occupied by them. And that we have to stop counting this disinformation as something which is a kind of not normal, but uh, obviously there. And that we have, we must not be lazy in communicating the things which are important for the public to know. And and for all of us, this is a challenge now. COVID and uh, health information, we are starting the very uh, uh, intense period in introducing the green policy. So it's not uneasy to predict what kind of disinformation we will see. The prices of food, the prices of cars, cars banned. Uh, we will ban, no, don't, don't quote me. <laughs> Uh, uh, the 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 beef this these kind of things will be spread for sure and we, I don't need big fantasy to imagine so we have to not to counter it we have to be first to communicate properly with full respect to the citizens to the society which needs information so I think that we have neglected something uh, we have neglected the impact this information might have and we have neglected the obligation to inform people properly about all the things where there might be some nervousness some some false in misinterpretation uh, so i think that we have to adapt our way of communication to this new new form so there's um there's a big role to play for proactive communication efforts. Exactly. I'm very glad to hear you say that because yeah. I can take the opportunity to mention that EPC is currently working on a project relating to exactly that um, idea of proactive communication in the field of migration specifically uh, for the purpose of countering disinformation. 
Vice President, thank you so much for your time. I know you have to leave us shortly, um, so I will take the opportunity to move on to the panel. I'm sure that many of the topics that you have uh, discussed today will come up again and we will uh, talk about them in more depth in the rest of the session. If you can do me a favour, speak please about education. Education because and media I, literacy, I think this I have a tendency to speak about short term measures, of course, for the sake of political my political medal. <laughs> <laughs> but but education has to be has to be emphasized and, and we have to find the ways how to make the people more resilient against the, the stupidities and, and incredible conspiracy theories and and so please, uh, if you can uh, touch upon that, and I will catch the results of your debate afterwards through my colleagues who are monitor or not monitoring, yeah. following the debate. Uh, thank you very much. Have a very good day. See you later in one year, maybe. Thank you very much, Vice President. Um, certainly, I'm sure we'll touch on this as well. Um, we know we have a lot of ground to cover, so I'm, I'm going to move on now and introduce the rest of the panel. Um, thank you. Bye bye. Thank you and uh, have a good day. So um, now that we've heard the, uh, the general context from the Vice President, I'd like to first zoom in a little bit on uh, the audit on the disinformation um, efforts, first of all, and its findings and recommendations, and then zoom out a little bit to look at the big picture again and maybe come back to a few of those uh, points. Um, so we will first hear from Mr. Tomei, who is the member of the European Court of Auditors, who was responsible uh, for the audit in question. Um, and then we've heard a little bit from the European Commission and about the, the different institutions involved um, from the BP. Um, so I'm happy to say that we are also joined today by Lutz Gullner, the head of division for strategic communications, of the European External Action Service. And last but not least, I'll introduce Nadja Kovalchikova, who is the program manager at the Alliance for Securing Democracy uh, in the German Marshall Fund of the United States, who will be able to give us an independent expert perspective and maybe touch on a few of those things that we talked about at the end. Um, Mr. Tomei, I will start with you. Uh, please, could you tell us a little bit more about the European Court of Auditors audit on disinformation and uh, why did the court decide to look into this subject and why now? Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning to, to everybody. First of all, I would like to, to thank the European Policy Center for the organization of this event and for having invited uh, me to present the work uh, carried out by the European Court of Auditors in the domain of disinformation. Is the EU prepared to fight disinformation campaigns from abroad? And when I say disinformation, I am not referring to illegal content or misleading adversiting, reporting errors, satire, or parody, or clearly identified partisan news and commentary. In the context of uh, our special report published early this month, disinformation is the creation, presentation, and dissemination of verifiably false or misleading information which may cause public harm. Such public harm includes threats to democratic, political, and policy-making processes, as well as to the protection of the EU citizens' health, the environment, or security. Any attempt to maliciously or intentionally undermine or manipulate public opinion represents a grave threat to the EU itself. At the same time, fighting disinformation represent a major challenge and it should not impair EU fundamental values like the freedom of opinion and expression like uh, Vice President Georgiovia re referred to. We all are aware that uh, this is a, a very fast evolving policy area and new actions are on, on the table. But in our report, we have examined the EU action plan uh, against disinformation set in 2018 for, for, for reasons of, 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 of focusing and, and timing of our audit. We have, <clears throat> we have uh, examined uh, whether the plan was relevant when drawn up and uh, whether it is delivering its, its, its intended results. 
We have checked whether the action plan was relevant for tackling this information and was underpinned by the sound financial accountability, uh, sound financial accountability framework. We have examined uh, the actions, uh, if the actions were implemented as planned. Overall, we have concluded that the EU action plan was relevant but incomplete. And even though its implementation is broadly on track and there is evidence of positive developments, some results have not been delivered as intended. What does this mean in practice? First, uh, to draw up the action plan, the Commission used the input it received from several stakeholders and experts and launched an extensive public consultation. However, we have identified shortcomings in the coordination arrangements between the different services in the Commission and in the St European External Action Service. As we have also uh, identified shortcomings in the accountability framework, notably in the monitoring and reporting. Since its inception in 2018, uh, the EU action plan has not been updated. Although the European Democracy Action Plan and the proposal for a digital service act um, uh, refers to certain actions originally set out in the EU action plan against disinformation, they cannot be considered as a comprehensive update of the action plan. As we state in the report, having different action plans and initiatives uh, pursuing similar objectives uh, uh, makes coordination more complex and increases the risk of inefficiencies. In the second part of our report, we focus on the implementation of the actions under each of the four pillars of the EU action plan and the extent to which they have improved the way the EU tackles this information. And we have concluded that the three external action service strategic communications task forces have improved the EU capacity to forecast and respond to disinformation activities and have contributed substantially to effective communication and promoted, promoting EU policies in neighboring countries. However, the task forces mandates do, do not adequately cover the full range of disinformation actors and threats, including emerging threats, as it can be the case of China and other countries. We have also found that the site EU versus Disinfo, launched by the External Action Service, has been instrumental in raising awareness about Russian disinformation. In relation to the rapid alert system, we have found that it had facilitated information sharing among member states and EU institutions. However, at the time of our audit, the rapid alert system had never issued alerts and consequently has not been used to coordinate young attribution and response as initially envisaged. Pillar three of the action plan is about monitoring of the code of practice, which set out a number of voluntary measures to be taken by the online platforms. We concluded that the code of practice was a good first step to engage the online platforms, but falls short of its goal to hold them accountable for their actions and their role in actively tackling this information. Last but not least, Pillar 4 deals with the media literacy initiatives, this education uh, issue we were talking about uh, earlier. In this regard, we have found that there, there are a multitude of EU and member state initiatives that address media literacy and a plethora of policy documents. However, these actions are not coordinated under an overarching strategy for strengthening societal resilience against disinformation. 
in our in in our our report we issue also a series of recommendations with the view of improving the eu ability to tackle this information more concretely we recommend that the european external action service and the commission should improve the coordination and accountability framework of its actions against this information, coordination and accountability first. Then we also recommend that the external action service should reassess the policy objectives of the Stratcom division and its tax forces uh, to take on board uh, new threats and consider also outsourcing less sensitive uh, tax for the sake of uh, uh, improving the, the budgetary resources and management. Also, the European uh, External Action Service uh, should, uh, according to our recommendation, increase participation in the rapid alert system by member states and online platforms. And also, uh, the Commission uh, in the developing of new strategies like the new Dem European Democracy Action Plan should improve the monitoring and accountability of online platforms. As far as media literacy is concerned, we recommend that the Commission uh, should adopt a strategy that includes combating disinformation as an integral part of the, the, uh, its uh, um, media literacy initiatives. Finally, uh, we also recommend that the Commission should take further steps to ensure that the European Digital Media Observatory project, uh, um, which aims to develop a European network of fact checkers, meets its ambitious objectives and in this regard there are also lessons to be learned from past initiatives we referred to in our report ladies and gentlemen i started this presentation by asking whether the eu is prepared to fight disinformation campaigns after our audit I can be said that if this information affecting the EU is tackled but not tamed. That's precisely the, the title of, of our report. The EU action plan against disinformation was relevant when drawn up, but it remains incomplete and a lot of uh, more is to be done, especially in the domains of uh, better coordination and accountability among the, the different actors con concerned, both at EU level and also uh, national uh, level. Thank you very much for, for your attention. And as I said, uh, um, congratulations for these initiatives uh, to bring in, uh, bring, bring in uh, actors in this uh, domain, uh, together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Tomei, for this overview of the audit. Um, this is uh, already touching on a few of the things that the, the Vice President mentioned, um, so it's good to see the train of, of thought here. And I'd like to take the opportunity now to turn to the European External Action Service, since they've been named um, a few times. Um, and uh, there are some recommendations in the audit which are specifically for um, the external action service, especially uh, those regarding the, uh, the STRATCOM uh, divisions, uh, the task forces and the rapid alert system. So, Mr. Gulner, I'll turn to you now, um, please. What is your reaction to what you've heard so far? And in what ways do you feel that uh, your unit um, is already implementing some of these recommendations or, or working towards improvements in the areas where the audit has uh, found some deficiencies. Thank you, Paul, and uh, thank you for this kind invitation also to discuss uh, these, these issues, um, uh, also referring to what the, what the Vice President has said. Um, it remains a very, very fast moving uh, kind of issue and a very new policy area for the European Union. 
um, if we look back, you know, um, five years ago, the issue was nowhere on any of the political agendas. Uh, it emerged uh, as an external threat, let's call it like this, in the context of, um, uh, in particular, Russia's action um, following the uh, illegal occupation of uh, or annexation of, uh, of, the, of um, the Crimea, of the war in Ukraine. Um, and that was recognized actually by the leaders of the European Union in uh, council conclusions. Let's not forget, this was not just some policy idea coming from, from somewhere in the bottom. This comes from the very top. And if I look out of my window here of my office in the external action service, I see exactly that group discussing again related issues here related to that actor. So the issue is still very much alive, but it has changed, has enormously changed. It is actually, it has um, not only two, it has many faces, um, many challenges, you know, that we need to look at. It is certainly a societal issue because it has an internal component, of course, because it is related to uh, information consumption uh, habits that have changed. It is um, related to the way the information space is, is changed. Um, to the way um, also information is is produced, you know, not everything is negative. It's just changes, you know, that we are seeing. But as in all changes, there are good and bad sides. And I think there is a huge kind of societal, also internal issues to to look at these issues. But and that is the point where my team and the external action service is, of course, at the forefront, not for everything, but for the issue of when it becomes, uh, let's say, a security and foreign policy issue. And I really need to underline this point. Um, the problem of disinformation, of information manipulation cannot be reduced to just an external issue. You know? It's far more complex. Uh, many more actors, uh, many more issues, and also many more answers are, are necessary, but it is also an issue of, uh, of security and, and foreign policy issue. And that is important. Second point is uh, disinformation. We use this term a lot, and uh, we heard a number of, um, of uh, kind of definitions, conceptual definitions already um, of it. But we will always have uh, this, uh, let's say, the need to find a good balance between um, uh, guaranteeing the freedom of expression. So I think the Americans would call it not pouring out the baby with the bathwater, you know, in our attempt to look into what we can do about this and what we should do about this. And that's why I would plead very strongly for a bit of changed approach, you know, that would not so much look at is the content right or wrong, uh, or even do we like the content or don't we like it, but much more to what are actors, what are participants in our information space, what are they doing? And in particular, we should identify if there is a specific manipulation of the information space that can be done technically, that can be done also by way of content that can be done with uh, certain techniques, uh, with certain tactics as well, with certain procedures. Um, and I think there is the key um, also for us to tackle this issue in policy terms um, and in, in the way how to address it. Otherwise, we will always work with a very blurred kind of term of disinformation of right or wrong. and. The disinformation sometimes in the eyes of the one is uh, is the truth in the eyes of the other, and that will always be a tension there. Um, but again, I, I focus on the external side here as a security issue. And there also, um, I spare you all the, the details of what happened over the past three, four years. Um, we have made quantum leaps, you know, we have made enormous steps uh, in terms of setting up a system, a policy frame, new instruments. Um, Mr. Tomei mentioned the rapid alert system, for example, which is not so much just alerting each other, which is really creating for the first time ever between the member states, a place to exchange experience, to, ex to exchange kind of the, the, the approaches, you know, what, what are you doing? What are we doing? How do we tackle with this? And if I can refer to recent elections, for example, where our colleagues are working very closely together to understand, you know, what works, what doesn't work. And since this is 
new territory for many of, of all of us, you know, also for many policymakers um, and also for kind of at the technical level, at the, at the working level, we need this space to, to exchange, to learn from each other and to develop these, uh, these elements. That is very, very important for me to say. And, and I can say from our work with international partners, um, the EU is really at the forefront here um, in, in the sense of trying out things, in the sense of developing a policy frame, in the sense also of finding the right balance between guaranteeing the, the freedom of speech and not impeding on, on this part, but at the same time, find instruments that allow us to, to, uh, to do something about this. And in that sense, the, um, uh, the report of the court is, uh, is an excellent reminder of, uh, of a number of these things, also the recommendations. We have discussed very closely with the team of Mr. Tome over one and a half years in all details. Um, has been very instructive, helpful in, uh, in the way forward, because of course, we're not yet there. We still need to invest, we need to continue. So maybe just uh, last words, because I don't give a presentation, but I'm just reacting. What can we do actually? What are the, the pillars, so to say, that we need to look at? In my view, we have, uh, we have four areas and some of them are pretty big um, that we need to further invest and further kind of develop the tools. The first one sounds always a bit like a, like a commonplace, but it is so important. We need to further sharpen our situational awareness, our understanding, our monitoring, our understanding what the issue is, because it's moving quickly uh, in its security dimension, but also in its societal dimension. Um, otherwise, we build policy on, uh, let's say, anecdotal evidence, and that would be, in my view, uh, a mistake. And that is something that we are doing um, here in terms of developing the situational awareness, new instruments, new methodology, uh, being clear on what we're looking at and finding a bit an, uh, an objective way also of measuring these things. I think super important and uh, one of the keys. Second point is maybe the huge area, and the vice president has mentioned it um, also, it's the place of, okay, how can we strengthen our own resilience against this information? These are very different things that come together. Uh, it is certainly the proactive communication that was mentioned uh, that EPC is also working on is an important element, but it's just one of many, many, many things that we need to do. Uh, there is the strategic communications in the sense of engaging with very specific audiences, also vulnerable audiences inside, outside the European Union. There is the issue of awareness raising campaigns. There is the issue of media literacy. Um, there is the issue of strengthening uh, the work of media systems. Also here, the European Democracy Action Plan has a, a very good holistic way. It's always easy said, you know, and you need to drill it down to very tangible hands-on activities uh, that is important. So this resilience, um, maybe while I'm talking, I can uh, share a little graphic with you uh, that actually you see what I'm talking about. Um, if you can see this um, beautiful um, donut shaped uh, function here that uh, explains a little bit what I'm talking about because we have done this, uh, this work. Sorry, it's very small letters. Um, you don't need to read everything, but the idea here is that we have four areas, situational awareness, the resilience building, you see what all falls under this. These are all elements that need to be thought together. Then we need to think about um, what we call disruption. So if we want to stop certain things, well, we need to have the right instruments for it based on legislation, on laws, on this balance. Um, also here, we spoke about the code of practice. We spoke about um, the, the Digital Services Act, which is exactly doing this in a measured way. Um, and then looking at the security and foreign policy side, um, we also need to strengthen, of course, these external uh, elements. Also here, Ms. Europa uh, talked about some of these things. We called it here diplomatic responses. To see some of these little boxes in gray, you know, this is where the work is in progress. Um, and actually, I just wanted to share this uh, because that is my last point. And back to you, Paul, is whatever we do about this phenomenon of, uh, of um, uh, disinformation and of foreign interference of information manipulation, there will not be one instrument that will help us. There will not be one policy uh, that will address all the issues. 
we need to think broad, we need to think interdisciplinary, and I think uh, that, is, that is really the key. And here the report of the Court of Auditors, I think, has made this point crystal clear again, how we need to continue and to further strengthen this, uh, this multidisciplinary approach. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you, Lutz. That's really useful and uh, great to have this insight into the, all of the different areas that you were focusing on. Um, I wonder if I could very quickly just ask you something that is rather more um, mundane and, and maybe not quite so exciting, but I think it's important because it touches on one or two of the things that uh, Mr. Tomei and the Vice President mentioned, which is about resources, um, money, staffing, expertise, uh, particularly in the task forces in uh, response to emerging threats. Um, so obviously geopolitical circumstances are changing, there are new actors, um, there might be one very large country very close to the EU's borders, which is traditionally seen as a, um, shall we say, a, a source of a lot of um, disinformation or influence operations targeting the EU. But there are more and more other actors stepping on the scenes. That requires new and constant developing um, expertise, but it also requires further uh, resources and staffing in the units and so on. Is this something that you feel you're making enough progress on, um, or I'm sure more money is always welcome. Um, but uh, of course, the audit was also taking into account whether um, resources were being well allocated. In your view, are the resources sufficient given how much other actors are putting into this sort of uh, campaign? Well, it's a bit of a rhetorical question, Paul. Um, of course, it's never sufficient if you have a, a big and emerging uh, um, kind of challenge uh, ahead of you. And I think the, the points that were made in the report of the Court of Auditors, also reflected by the way in the discussions that are going on in the European Parliament at the moment, uh, in the Special Committee on Foreign Interference, uh, which is doing excellent work, uh, by the way, very important to map the issue, etc. Um, resources are always, always need to commensurate to what the task is, you know. And I would just like to put one element for further reflection uh, out there. Of course, you know, we need to, to invest more and we are doing this, you know, we are also building for these new actors, etc. You cannot do this overnight, by the way. You know, you need expertise, experts. Uh, we need to be careful with what we are looking at. Already the term disinformation, for example, you know, does it apply in the same way to, to each and every actor? Maybe it's more information manipulation. Maybe it's more interference uh, uh, activities, etc. So just kind of closing this, this brackets. What I think is very, very important, and that's why also this... Um, uh, this discussion that we're having today is maybe crucial, um, is to strengthen kind of across, uh, across the different actors in our society, between the, uh, whatever, the European institutions, the member states, civil society organizations, think tanks, you know, we need to strengthen this because uh, the division that I uh, have the honor to, to lead here with a fantastic team, uh, will not, uh, I say it a little bit drastic, will not save the world, you know, um, it is too small, it needs to connect, it needs to strengthen uh, the, the different links, it needs to empower civil society also, because this is the only way we can really address it. And there I think we play our role, yes, we need to constantly be agile and flexible and, and adapt, and that is what we are doing. Um, uh, the call, I think, for new resources also goes a little bit to the budgetary authorities in the parliament, in the member states. I think they are listening very, very carefully. And in that sense, um, kind of, of course, there's still some, some uh, let's say, some way to be covered. Great. Thank you. One very last point, because um, there is a question from the audience, and it's also something I was wondering myself, the graphic you shared. Is it accessible? Can we see it in, in greater detail and save it and take it home? Or is it um, internal only? Well, not internal, otherwise I wouldn't have shown it to you. <laughs> but it is something that we still want to, to refine a little bit and we will certainly soon kind of pack it in, in with some of our publications. So, uh, But I wanted to show it to this audience. Uh, I looked a little bit through who is, uh, who is in this call today or in this presentation and uh, 
I think very, very um, knowledgeable people um, where I wanted to make this point, let's think of these things together. You know, people are here who have a focus on media literacy. There are people here who have a focus on journalists. There are people here, uh, also EP people, you're doing the work yourselves, you know, where I say we need to strengthen proactive communications on specific issues, you know, like migration. Um, like uh, COVID uh, related issues, like the vaccines, etc. All right, but let's combine these things. That's the key. Great. I think coordination is already one of the, the key words of the discussion today. I think all of the speakers have mentioned the need for uh, effective coordination between all the relevant actors. Nadja, I would like to come to you as um, independent expert um, and hear what your thoughts are on the EU's efforts against disinformation in general. Um, we've heard, for example, uh, the European Democracy Action Plan and to a certain extent the measures in the Digital Services Act as well are relevant. They represent a kind of next step following the, the 2018 Action Plan against disinformation, but at the same time they're not really just a simple sequel. As Mr. Tomei mentioned, uh, the relationship between the older action plan and the newer initiatives is uh, not a, a straightforward one. I was wondering, what's your take in general terms about uh, how the EU is doing in terms of its uh, coordination and its actions against disinformation? And uh, what other areas do you see as uh, needing improvement going forward? Thanks, Paul, and thank you to all the previous speakers because so many very uh, relevant and um, and I would say already quite detailed points were mentioned. So I'll try to build on that because uh, um, there has been very clear overview of the European Democracy Action Plan, the Digital Services Act, and um, I do consider them uh, as good uh, steps uh, forward. Um, I agree with uh, quite a few points of uh, Mr. Bodilio Tome mentioned. Uh, from their analysis and the audits of that. So, uh, but that's okay, that's oh, that's fine. There are always things to improve and that means that uh, uh, things are happening and people are working on this. And one of them, I would just try to highlight what um, Lutz just mentioned this, uh, not only multidisciplinary approach, but multi-stakeholder approach. I think that is really something that is uh, critical and essential to be much more effective in countering the uh, information manipulation. And I will be using this term of information manipulation rather than disinformation, because one also uh, for the same reason as Luz also highlighted in terms of uh, looking into the techniques and the tools, but also rather than context, looking at the behavior, the amplification of that, the mechanisms, the actors um, that are amplifying it and potential intent uh, for that as well, that touches rather on the foreign policy side as well. So this multi-stakeholder approach, I think, is something that we can definitely elaborate and expand, not to the extent that it's about everything and that we don't focus enough, but I do uh, see a potential for uh, engaging more researchers. Um, what I have also observed is that there has been more focus on uh, more practical tools and models like simulations and exercises to understand things in the real time and, uh, and have the tools that need to also evolve as the techniques of the uh, amplification of information manipulation are, are evolving. So this is something I think very useful. It does include engagement of very, you know, hands-on NGOs or experts, cyber experts, uh, digital experts, but also psychologists that are able to assess uh, different um, uh, potential impacts uh, on uh, people's decisions uh, when they are part of these simulations and, uh, and predict things, uh, so be able to be more resilient. and. This term of resilience, I think, is resonating not only today and at the EU level, but it's also a term or terminology resili uh, resilience that is um, resonating at the NATO level, at the transatlantic level. And there I see a lot of potential of uh, further engagement as at the moment it's not necessarily the same understanding of what do we mean by resilience in, in, this, uh, in our uh, respective fields and respective countries. So I think there is an um, important way to engage further on defining it and seeing how we can have more complementary tools uh, by NATO, by EU, by the member states. So there I see a lot of potential. I also see much more need to uh, 
to focus on the implementation of the European Democracy Action Plan and Digital Services Act at the national level, because there is quite a um, varying level of uh, not only societal awareness, but also of the government's focus on um, implementing these more European ideas, plans, action measures. Uh, and uh, what needs to be done is, of course, to tailor it to the national context. So EU is providing the framework, the policy framework, but ultimately the member states have to figure out as well how, how is the most effective way to implement it. And, and there is so much work to be done across so many member states still. Um, and perhaps one other point to just raise, because we focus a lot on the information manipulation, but we need to make sure that we see it as a part of a wider toolkit especially when we think in the foreign policy terms, for example. This is many times also about the money. Monetizing was also mentioning of these practices. It's about, the, it's about the foreign money. It's about the use of the money that are overt or covered. Um, it's about the, also the links to the um, economic uh, potential coercion, right? Like what messages are amplified? They have a reason why they're amplified. Uh, to certain uh, audiences at certain times. Uh, so there needs to be, I think, this um, work not only in the context of hybrid threats, but just kind of um, timely ways of assessing this in the wider uh, toolkit manner. Um, so this is one, one other thing. And one uh, point that I also uh, found interesting, and it's very difficult, um, is from the European Court of uh, Auditors report, is the, the KPIs, the key performance indicators. How do you measure? Uh, the success of uh, these tools and the measurements uh, implemented or adopted by the EU uh, institutions or the national institutions. And this is something that needs to be very well coordinated, as of course we discussed many other things need to be coordinated, but um, there is a lack of understanding of the success of, uh, of these policies and the frameworks and the guidelines um, in a comparative manner. So I think these KPIs, um, as difficult as they are going to be, because how do you really measure many of the things is, is a question that I think will we'll take a lot of time to, to decide in a, in a common way. But it's really important to address this in an effective, in an effective way. And here it brings me, and perhaps to the last point before we can uh, uh, go to, to some more questions um, uh, and engage on that with the speakers, um, is the point of the education, as Commissioner Yorova mentioned, um, and as you requested for us to touch upon it, uh, I'm happy to do that because many of these uh, tools and measures are short term measures and they are also for obvious reasons sometimes because we need to respond and react uh, in a timely manner. But this education is um, sometimes um, considered as like just bringing it to the schools for the new generation for the younger generation, for them to be more uh, literate in media, um, in media environment or digital environment. But I think one, one aspect we really need to also keep in mind when we speak about education is this uh, outside of school education, because there has been research done a lot, a lot of the um, uh, false or manipulated information has been actually amplified, not necessarily by the, the young children or the, ad, or the adolescents or so, but actually by older generations. So how do we make sure that we bring this awareness in, a, in an acceptable way and a accessible way uh, to also the um, older generations that are, you know, already facing perhaps also challenges of just uh, uh, just being orientated in, uh, in this very fast evolving digital space uh, with all kinds of new applications and platforms. So, but they receive it through some context, um, the information uh, that is manipulated, uh, but it's because of all the other platforms from where this information travels until it actually gets to their email, um, email box. So I think this is, um, this is another, think to think of the longer term, how to have this very cross-generational and the longer term approach in a way that is accessible to people. Um, and also thinking, of course, of the languages, of the, of the ways of communication and all of the stratcom, strategic communications approaches that we can, of course, uh, discuss further. So the ways of how to do it, but keeping that in mind and have make sure that we engage also different generations in this is good. And just to give an example, something very concrete that I thought was um, 
interesting and it's a, it's a good example around elections, for example. A lot of this um, information manipulation happens in an increased way around the elections. And we should start thinking about the European Parliament elections 2024 now <laughs> and not, not six months before. Um, and I think uh, we have now the uh, lessons learned um, and more resources to do that. Um, but also at the national level, what was, for example, a good example of what happened in the Netherlands in the recent elections is the Code of Contact and Political Advertising. That was a new initiative. Uh, there was an uh, independent international idea, uh, body engaged to uh, coordinate and cooperate with the Ministry of Interior. It's a first time of, you know, model in Europe of this kind and this type of um, uh, practice. And uh, I think there are more of those similar efforts in uh, in other countries, so there is a lot to learn from, but I think it also needs to get a little bit more visibility and uh, and just uh, we need to be more able to connect the dots uh, together. But there are good practices, and I think this is one of those that we can build on our election table they organize with the civil society. And we can also discuss about Germany, the code of practice and disinformation evolution that is happening there at the national level and also in other countries. So a lot of concrete things that are happening and uh, uh, can be helpful for for uh, for better multi-stakeholder, but also effective um, uh, way to tackle this information or information manipulation. Thanks, Nadja. Yeah, I, I think that there's so much going on, um, not only in terms of the, uh, the narratives that we need to try and counter, but also the initiatives to do that work, um, that actually we also need to um, put in a bit of work just to understand um, what relevant activities, what initiatives, research and so on is happening. And I think that perhaps some of the routes for coordination that have been mentioned today, such as the Rapid Alert System for government actors or the Digital Media Observatory for civil society actors and researchers can play a, a role in, in helping people to understand what else is going on in their sector and to find ways to work together. For the last 15 minutes, I would like to open the floor um, to some more questions from the audience. We've already got a few in the question and answer box. Um, if there are any other questions, I'd like to invite people either to put them in writing in the Q&A box, or if you would like to intervene um, orally, uh, then please use the raise hand function in Zoom, and we will invite you to step in and take the floor. Let me um, start off with a, a couple of questions that are from um, Stefan Schreck relating to uh, disinformation on vaccines, which is very much the, um, the kind of current big topic, I suppose. Um, and uh, he is asking, first of all, how much of the disinformation about vaccines is homegrown and how much comes from hostile external state actors? I would maybe add a, another aspect to that question, which is, to what extent is it easy to tell? Um, to what extent can you even make the distinction um, or is the origin actually rather obscure in most cases? Um, and Stefan also asks, how can action to counter vaccine disinformation be coordinated uh, with actions by other services against other types of disinformation in practical terms? Um, so I guess um, this is basically about how do you make sure that the various different actors involved are supporting one another in their um, uh, in their efforts to communicate and to uh, counteract this information. Um, there is another question which is uh, particularly for Lutz, so maybe I will take that as well because I think Lutz might have a, um, a, a point or two to say on the previous question um, relating to uh, big tech platforms. Um, do you feel that there's enough cooperation coming from the social media platforms? Um, and uh, I guess I, I could also ask related to that, um, to what extent is the EAS in touch with the platforms? Because I know the commission is for the code of practice. Does the EAS have a seat at that table as well? I will ask those questions to Lutz first, but uh, the other panelists may also have reactions and want to come in as well, please. Thank you, and thank you for these, these questions. Um, on vaccines, well, that is a, a prime example how disinformation works and how multi multifaceted it is. You know, it's mixing, and I think we have even issued, not I think we have even issued a full communication about this last year. Um, 
we mix a lot of very different things. There can, there can be the part of misinformation. People just see something, think it's true, amplify it, you know, because they share it with their friends. Uh, there are the famous conspiracy narratives, you know, that are being pushed. There, there are real malign activities from internal actors and kind of, and that is not only the cherry on the cake, but also a part of this, uh, this broader picture. There are also external actors uh, that are evolving this. Is it easy to distinguish all these things? No, of course not. That's why you remember in my, in my donut chart, uh, there is quite a big part on this yellow situational awareness, knowing, kind of distinguishing these, these things. Otherwise we mix everything and we can't find any policy response anymore. What do we do about misinformation? Well, about misinformation is really the issue also about educating, of giving alternative information sources, you know, that uh, um, having exactly what also happened. And I think we made good progress also with the platforms, you know, that um, in the in the heights of the pandemic, you know, when you when you Googled or even on Twitter, you know, um, if you used or if you had content related to the pandemic, there was always kind of a little reference point, you know, do you want to know more? Um, uh, kind of check out this, you know, so to basically do what um, what a uh, an informed society should should be doing, and that is different sources um, with a with a certain scrutiny, but in the end uh, treat the citizens also as as uh, let's say as adults, you know, who can who can then form their own opinions. That is the key thing. And I would strongly um, subscribe to what Nadia has said in, in terms of, um, you know, it's not only the wrong or false, the, the information manipulation can also come from the fact that only one specific narrative is flooding kind of the information space. And you think this is the mainstream thinking, you know, and we know how the human brain is, is working, you know, then you think, okay, everybody thinks that, then it must be, it must be true, but it's not necessarily because we're speaking about kind of uh, filtered bubbles or we speak about these, uh, these elements. Um, but we still have instruments. And I think if I can refer you to our reporting in particular on COVID related uh, disinformation, related to external actors. We have issued six reports over the past two years. Um, it shows very quickly that we can also cut kind of a little bit through the bushes and, and see kind of what is happening. And that is a very disturbing uh, um, uh, development also, you know, that the technique that is being used is very often that an existing societal debate is being exploited by reinforcing, amplifying specific sometimes even genuine voices, but by um, amplifying them so much that the information space is actually manipulated because sometimes these are just fringe uh, voices. So that's why. Let's be careful with truth or not truth. Uh, this is about kind of activity to shape this. The second uh, question was about how do the platforms uh, work with us, with others? Well, first of all, in general, we all agree that there needs to be a framework, that there needs to be uh, also a policy framework. And that's why the code of practice, uh, the future DSA is, I think, the way ahead to put rules of the game um, out there and also not to make them at the disposal of, of goodwill, but uh, to have common, common rules of the game, how we approach it, what are the elements, etc. At the same time, I'm not part of those who say the platforms have totally kind of neglected this. No, they have done things, they have invested, we have made good progress, maybe not enough, maybe not clear enough, maybe not binding enough, uh, but we, um, for, for our work in particular on the external side, on the foreign information manipulation, have very good, uh, very good links to them. If I can uh, uh, refer to one example for those of you who are more interested in the foreign information manipulation, uh, the colleagues on the in Facebook, for example, have issued uh, recently a report on these. They call it uh, information operations, actually, of foreign actors. What has developed? Uh, what are the trends, et cetera, et cetera? These are very, very important elements for all of us. You know, for us as governmental or executive uh, kind of um, uh, players as much as for civil society, think tanks, researchers, etc. So I think we're on a good way there, but code of practice, 
DSA um, will be, in my view, the right approach to put the right uh, framework and also to make it accountable, transparent, and with clear, uh, with clear rules, you know, in case this does not work. That's great. Thanks, Lutz. I think that this is an important thing for us all to bear in mind. We use, uh, regarding definitions, we use the term disinformation as a kind of shorthand for what in reality are quite a lot of different things and different techniques and information manipulation, uh, information operations, influence operations, and so on, may all be more appropriate terms for uh, particular subsections of this broad subject. Um, and actually, we need to be very careful about that we know exactly what it is we're talking about in uh, particular areas. Also, of course, regarding genuine um, misinformation or um, amplified, uh, genuine opinions that are amplified artificially and this kind of thing. It's a very complicated sector. Um, but this links into one of the other audience questions that I wanted to raise, because I think it's a uh, um, an interesting one, maybe a little bit provocative, um, and I wanted to see um, your reactions to this. Uh, this is from Marcelo Martinez, who asks, shouldn't legitimate sources of information resort to the same tools and techniques that disinformation actors use? Because those have been proven to be efficient in making content go viral. I suppose the techniques we, we could have in mind might be um, using bots to promote content uh, more widely, or simply using clickbait uh, style titles, um, or more coordinated actions to improve the virality of content. Should the, the good guys, so to speak, be using um, techniques like this, or does this uh, start us off in the wrong direction? Nadia, maybe that would be a, a, a good question for you to come in on. And of course, if you have any reactions to the previous questions as well, please feel free to, to say. Sure. And, and yes, this is a question that many times, especially when we speak about the proactive communication and how to get our or the, the authoritative sources narratives into the information sphere or infosphere more. Um, I would rather say, you know, we should not go to the lowest common denominator. Um, we have the, the values that we need to protect for a healthy information space. So once we identify what do we mean by healthy uh, information space, where we speak about freedom of speech and not necessarily freedom of reach, or if so, there are certain limits of that, um, then uh, of course we have to follow our own rules. And if, you, if we follow the other rules, we have to accept that this will not be solved and the uh, information uh, space will not be healthier in a way that we wish to. So I would say um, once we have this clarity and this, uh, uh, and this criteria that we are asking from the platforms, from the countries, from the users to, uh, to apply and have the algorithms adjusted, um, that's a better way than just falling to the same level and then really making the information space even more um, uh, chaotic in a way. So uh, that would be kind of my answer, answer to that. Also keeping in mind that we are talking here about both foreign and domestic actors. And many times uh, the, the foreign actors also are trying to undermine the democratic principles and the institutions. And this is something we need to defend. So um, this is part of the healthy information space. And, uh, and we need to be rather models of how we want it to be shaped. I think that's one of the things we need to think more of, like how do we actually want it to look like? What is a healthy information space? And, and really push for that agenda to have, a, um, to have it more democratic and, and, um, uh, and clean, if, if I would say in that sense, but uh, um, that it's a broad term. Great. Now we're almost out of time, um, but to round things off, um, I had one last question uh, for Mr. Tomei, um, and that is, um, taking into account everything that we've heard today about how complicated the scenario is and uh, how many different actors are involved, how many different initiatives. Um, I wanted to ask, to what extent do you think that the new initiatives that are coming up, such as the Democracy Action Plan, are already going in the direction that the audit recommendations were, were recommending? Uh, now, of course, I understand the audit period ran up until September 2020, so it didn't take into account the period when the Democracy Action Plan and the Digital Services Act were um, unveiled at the end of, of last year. 
Um, but I wonder if you already have any comments or insights uh, into how these plans are already beginning to address some of the areas of weakness that the audit identified in the 2018 uh, action plan. And on that note, I think that will have to be our, our last uh, point that we can end on. No, uh, thank you very much for, for, for raising this, this point. Uh, one of the uh, strengths that, in our opinion, the uh, action plan against disinformation had was its comprehensive approach. The, the, the weakness were also clear, the lack of uh, effective coordination uh, and, and, uh, and also a, a quite of effective uh, monitoring and reporting framework. Uh, now, uh, and many of our recommendations uh, go in, in, in that the race, the, the direction. Uh, now, uh, of course, new initiatives are, are, are on the table. Some of them can even be considered uh, eventually as the implementation of some of our recommendations that the Commission has already accepted. And in that regard, uh, they, they are welcome. But uh, we will uh, in the position to judge uh, if the, the new initiatives, some of them are projects or some of them are well. The, the update of the of the code of practice is, is already a uh, good initiative, but we are in, not in the position of, of judging. We will do so in the future. That's how we work at the European Court of Auditors. We we issue our reports, we issue our recommendations, and after let's say two or three years, uh, we will monitor. But um, there is an, an if the more initiatives they, they are and the more initiatives are fragmented through different instruments like the new democracy action plan from digital service acts the um, new media initiatives the initiatives uh, um, um, from member states the more in is the need for for effective uh, coordination uh, and uh, let's have to have those indicators uh, for, for reporting, monitoring, or following what is on the table. And in that respect, I think the, the, our recommendation is, is, is valid. We should not uh, lose this holistic uh, approach because uh, at the end of the day, we, we have to be clear and keep our mind about what, why we are doing all these uh, efforts and uh, what are the fundamental uh, values we, we are protecting is not doing for for the sake of doing is just for, in order to to protect our pluralistic uh, free democratic societies so uh, and in this respect uh, i think i would insist that probably our recommendations in order to have a, a clear coordination clear monitoring and engaging the, the the digital platforms in a way that is also transparent and effective and, and ultimately protects a, a pluralism and free speech is, is good so i have no the answers now but eventually uh, we will be in the position to to do the follow-up and the monitoring in, in, in the future now let's hope that all these initiatives uh, uh, succeeding in, in effective uh, uh, tackling this information in an effective uh, way. Hope, let's hope so. Very good. That's uh, an, an excellent hope to bear in mind. Um, I think, oh, sorry, uh, Mr. Tomei, were you? No, no, I. Uh, I, I think maybe there was a, a slight um, hiccup in the connection there. We lost you for a minute. Sorry, sorry. Are, are you hearing me well now? I hear you well now, yes. No, no yes. Uh, to conclude, and um, very shortly now, uh, I was mentioning that uh, we will be in the position uh, to monitor uh, uh, all these initiatives in, in, in the coming future. Uh, let's hope they 
succeeding in, 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 in the objective they are pursuing, but I have insisted uh, also that the conclusions in our report to have a effective coordination and a effective monitoring and, and reporting on the initiatives and also uh, bringing in the internet platforms on board in an effective way, I think is essential. I, I hope you have heard me well now. Perfectly, perfectly well. And I think that it's a, a good point to end on. Thank you very much. Thanks. So let me um, take the opportunity now to um, thank all of our speakers. Um, and a big thank you to our participants as well uh, for joining on a, a Friday so close to the summer. Um, and I will sign off now simply by um, saying to everyone that they should um, stay safe from COVID, and, but stay safe from manipulative information as well. Let's hope that a, a vaccine for our uh, information environment uh, and manipulation is also in development. Um, so thank you once again to everybody and uh, wishing you a, a very good summer break if there is one coming up very soon for everyone. Thank you. Thank you.